Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 41. I don't, the number 42 has some meanings, which we might have to cover in the next episode um, from one of my favorite books and other things, but I haven't really thought of anything for 41, except it was the year after I turned 40 where I thought things would be different and they were kind of the same, uh, which I'm sure everyone goes through, right? You think you hit these huge milestones in your life and you're like, eh. I only bring this up because I was just in uh, Hawaii for Eric's next milestone, the big 5-0. So I'll just, I'll say happy birthday belatedly uh, for our listeners and watchers here. So Eric, joining me from a giant pond across, uh, happy belated birthday and uh, episode 41, here we are. Aloha, thank you. So great to, to see you. I haven't seen you since you were here. Uh, I know you flew back to Colorado. Amy flew back on Friday night and I'm hearing it's snowing a little bit there. You know exactly where I'm sitting and the view out my lanai, so I don't have to. Uh, I don't have to let our audience know how beautiful it is. Uh, I'm sure it's still 83 down. degrees and humid and windy. <laughs> yes, it is. But I woke up this morning around 5:30 and it was 68 degrees. So what they Ooh. considered to be fall on the island is just it's happening starting to happen. So it's, it's and it really beautiful. it just gets cold at night, right? Isn't that their fall version? Like it yes. gets like 10 degrees colder at night. That's it. <laughs> yes, it's it's still, as you remember from being down here a week ago, it's still close to 90 degrees and humid, which I know is not your preferred temperature range, but everybody everybody here says hi. They were so excited to meet you. And, Mucho mahalos. And the <laughs> birthday celebrations continue. I'm still being spoiled rotten here. Uh, I had another birthday cake delivered to, to me <laughs> poolside yesterday, so I'm going to have to start mountain biking quite a bit when I go home. Well That's deserved. Great. I don't know if you're going to be mountain bike when you get here, man. It's, <laughs> I think we've officially turned winter on it. It was 34 degrees, raining, grapple, and snow when we woke up. We had a little respite in the middle of the day, and the wind just kicked up. And uh, above 9,000 feet, we're looking at 48 inches tonight. So you can have that for right now because I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not ready. With that, though, let's, let's meet today's guest. And this is, I know, a topic for the two of us, which is extremely important. It's one of the main reasons that we put this podcast together way back in January. And uh, when I introduce today's guest, I think our, our audience will have a much better idea about what we're going to be speaking about today, but I know I'm really excited. And joining us today is Dr. Christian Heim. He is an award-winning clinical psychiatrist Australian music lecturer and a Churchill Fellow. He is a senior lecturer at the University of Queensland in the School of Medicine and in music has lectured at Manhattan School of Music, the University of Newcastle, and had a tenured position at the University of Wollongong, where he was nominated for a teaching award. He was on staff at several Australian hospitals. During his 20 years as a doctor, he has heard the stories of thousands of people. He speaks globally in person and virtually at law firms, medical organizations, leisure companies, and universities about preventative mental health. His writings, including his new book, Five Steps to Men's Mental Health, there's our little teaser, and public lectures reference medicine and music and cover a range of topics, including burnout, brain fitness, the mental health crisis, neuroplasticity, the neurobiology of love, healthy relationships as a protective factor. However, they primarily focus on how to get the right dose, and it's all in caps, of brain chemicals to help overcome 21st century mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, suicide, trauma, personality disorders, and addiction. With that, Let's welcome in from across another really big pond in Australia, Dr. Christian. Good morning, Dr. Christian. Good morning, Eric, and happy mm. birthday to you over there in Hawaii. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. I have to say, and I'll let you read between the lines on this, but Mark knows, I told him when he was here, there was once a time not, not too, too long ago where I did not think I would even see the age of 50. So to be here in Maui right now, uh, celebrating an extended 50th birthday is, uh, 
is extremely exciting. So thank you very much. And thank you for no, being that's with all right. us. That's all right. That's right. It's, it's really my privilege to be here, Eric. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you in Colorado. I just yes. want to let you know that my son just left Colorado. He had a bit of work there. So um, I feel an affinity weather-wise with Eric and just place-wise uh, with Mark. So it's great to be here. Thank you. How about, how about that for all those connections? That's so cool. And, and I have to be honest, I've been lucky enough to spend a couple of weeks in your country and I loved it. And um, it hasn't happened, obviously, the past couple of years during the pandemic, but we essentially become, I guess you'd call it Australia East, West. I mean, I don't know which way you'd want to go. Yeah. Um, so often I have tons of wonderful Australian friends, family, guests that I've skied with here for years. And um, so we're, we, we love it. Uh, we, and I'm excited to have you on. Um, and so, Dr. Christian, I'm going to open it up and I'm going to ask just a giant big question. It's sort of, sure. it's always this elephant in the room for us. And yep. then, you know, you take it and run with it and then we'll go wherever. But why do we have to talk about men's mental health differently than we talk about health overall? Okay, that's, that's actually a really great Chris, uh, question, Mark. And in a way, you're getting to the essence of the whole of the problem. And uh, the problem is, look, we have a great health system. We have a great mental health system. But the setup, the very setup that you've got to put your hand up to say, I need help. And the setup of sitting down with somebody face to face and saying, these are my problems. That's a setup that works really well for females because the female brain has adapted to be really good at making relationships. So the science tells us that the female brain is more verbal than the male brain. And look, that's, that's no surprise, quite frankly, right? The male brain is adapted to surveying a landscape and solving problems. So if a male brain feels comfortable solving problems, it feels inadequate if it's got to get somebody else in to solve its problems. Right. So guys tend to sort of say, I can do it. I will find a way. And then when you find that you can't quite find a way, that's when you put your hand up. OK, whereas females tend to be much more comfortable to put their hand up and say, I need some help, which is why the medical industry and particularly the mental health industry is set up for females to be comfortable rather than males. So that's it in a nutshell. So, and what I love about that and I, how we kind of just opened this discussion and jumped right in because the, the one quote that, that in your book that really jumped off the page for me was where you wrote, men tend to suffer in silence and yeah. then feel guilty for not coming up with their own solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, and it's spot on. And look, how many jokes are there about whether or not a man or a woman will stop the car to ask for directions, right? Like this isn't... <laughs> <laughs> and no offense, I, I'm not no, trying no. to like step no. on any scientist's toes, but I'm like, no. we know no. this shit, right? It's That's not. Right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And uh, I mean, my wife, of... my wife's even to the point where she'll tell me about something, and she's like, I just want to tell you, you don't have to solve it. And I'm like, well, <laughs> why, why are you telling me then? <laughs> yeah. that's right that's right and and in a way that's that's the gap between male and female communication but you know what mark viva la difference okay let's let's just get into the differences mm -hmm. negotiate them because we have a lot of fun along the way we don't have to pretend that we're the same we also don't have to put each other down for being different all right because this too is adaptive we actually evolved to be different so that we could use each other's strengths so that together we can make more of a difference in our society so if we stay together we'll actually be able to do it but men's mental health that's a problem so dr christian when when i hear we use a lot of the same words it was actually reading the first chapter of your book i was like wow i'm really excited to have this guy on i was like yeah. although we might just keep going yep that's what we think yep that's what we think but <laughs> that's good too yeah. but you used uh, there were a couple of words and you know eric just brought it up too silence yes. stigma yes. um solutions right and yes. and i think yes. i'll be honest one of the things and i've been very open i've been in i've been in therapy three times in my life yeah. Uh, two times very traditional talk therapy. And one of the situations that's always been hard for me is that sense of like, you know, whether or not there's a solution to this, like we, we can make it better, right? Which to me, you know, maybe it's my male brain, uh, better isn't a solution, right? Like, yeah. like it's not all the way fixed. It's something we have to 
and you know having to change my mind about that and realize that it's something that I am going to have to attend to. I'm going to have to take care of myself the same way yes. you <clears throat> take care of your car or other things. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest barrier to entry in that stigma world of a man, even if he knows there's something going on with him and he's not sure what it is and he knows he needs help, what do you think that biggest barrier to entry of putting the hand up and being like, hey, this isn't working, I need help. What do you think that is? Or what well, have you Mark, seen? Mark, in, in a way, we've been talking about it already. The, the barrier is actually <clears throat> being male, right? <laughs> now, now that, that, I know that that's not helpful and we'll find a way around that. But you see, <clears throat> if a male goes skiing, let's say in Colorado, breaks a bone, all right? They'll quite happy be, be taken to the hospital, right? See an orthopedic surgeon. It'll be put together. You'll have a few scars, all right? But it'll be fixed. After six weeks, you will walk again and you can go, look, <clears throat> skiing accident, broke bone, badge of honor. I can now walk again, all right? And that all feels good. Mental health, unfortunately, is not that clear cut. It means saying, oh my gosh, I have this problem. And look, wanting to kill yourself is a real problem. Yep. And uh, we're, we're not talking about the number of people that have actually killed themselves. We're talking about the number of guys that actually think about killing themselves. And you know what? That's getting close to 100%, but we will never get the studies to prove that. So it's part of the human condition. And then when you put your hand up, you've got to trust somebody else so much. And then you've got to tolerate saying, we can make this better. But to get to a stage where it will go away, that's actually very difficult. You can get there, right? It does happen. But for a lot of people, it's a long road before you get someplace. And that feels so uncomfortable because there's nothing in your body that says you broke a bone, right? You are suffering for a reason. People look at you and they think that you're normal, right? Which you are, but you have all this stuff going on in your head that is threatening your very existence, and here's, here's an amazing thing. People think that I'm the only one that's having thoughts like that. And unfortunately, uh, men tend to keep quiet about that because of all the stigma. And look, in, in my book, I go for, through some of the reasons too. And I, I go back to the time of hunter-gatherers where men got together and they had to go out and let's say hunt a kangaroo, right? Now, if you're a male, you want to be part of that. And you want to be part of the success of that. You want to be part of the team that got the kangaroo that would feed the tribe for the next week, right? If you're feeling bad, you don't sort of say, look, I'm feeling bad, guys. Count me out for today. Oh, all right. Well, then your family will just get a less of a portion of our kangaroo. Uh, no, sorry. There's nothing wrong with me. Count me in. I'm there. And it's simplistic, but a lot of our interactions actually work this way. We find it really difficult to talk in front of each other about some of the things that we're going through. No, and, and doctor, you speak to it. And um, I, I shared with quite recently, my brother started listening to the podcast and uh, he was very appreciative, but then called me and was like, hey, by the way, you never told me you were depressed. Yeah, that's um, right. And, that's exactly and, right. Yeah. and of course, you know, me being a smart ass, like you never asked, you know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but there is this sense of, whether it's discomfort or, you know, and, and I'd love to hear more of what you think about this too, is that sense of loneliness or being alone. We yes. hear that from men and women, yes. but we always hear it from men. Like there's never, we haven't spoken to a single man who was like, well, I thought everybody, you know, had problems like this. No, no one's ever said that. No, that's um, right. yes. And what, and, and what, what do you, besides being male, yes. <laughs> what, what might we attribute that to? Okay, so, so there are a few things. Uh, firstly, all of our society is becoming lonelier and we have a lot of science to, to back that up. Uh, what we're doing right now, our screen technology has been absolutely fantastic and I love it, but it comes at a cost. And the strange cost is that it actually comes with social disconnect, which means that we're spending time face to face a whole lot less. We get together in clubs a whole lot less. We get together in worship services a whole lot less. We get together in even sporting events and as friends a whole lot less. And our studies show, whereas most of us had five or six people a couple of decades ago that we would call close friends, now it's down to one or two with over 25% of people 
saying, I don't have any friends. I don't have anybody that I can rely upon. And that's the way our society is going. So what's happened is men have always felt lonely, but because of the added burden of the direction of society, it's tipped people over a threshold. Whoops, too much loneliness. I, I used to be able to just get around and just stand in a circle of mates and just talk crap, but I don't have that anymore and it's making me feel really lonely. So speaking and going on that and also going back to what you had said earlier about men versus women on the topic of communication, a few, yeah. nights, ago, a few nights ago, I went out to dinner with a couple of my female friends here on the island and everyone, we discussed the podcast and the, the topic of mental health came up and three hours later, <laughs> when we got up from the table, um, what I was so struck by was how open and willing both of these women were to have this conversation about yes. their own personal mental health and then share it with me, someone yes. they've, they've known for a few years. Yeah. But then I started in my own mind, knowing we were going to have this discussion today, starting to draw that juxtaposition with how many people yes. in my own life I've had that conversation with who are men and who I feel comfortable having that conversation with. One of them happens to be my co-host here, but it, it really struck me as such a difference on how these two women were, were going so, so deep into each other's psychological backgrounds and things that had happened to them. And I just couldn't help but think if only we could get more men to move in this direction. Um, that suicide number that's in your book, four times you know, the rate of women would, would drastically be reduced. It would, but it's not all bad. Men are men for a reason. And, and look, um, Eric, I've got to put my hand up here. I'm a male as well, all right? Yep. So I can, I can talk as a therapist, all right? Uh, but when it comes to my friends, you know, I, I'm not just there talking about my feelings all the time. In fact, I get into trouble when I do sometimes because it becomes so uncomfortable, right? Now, why is that? And again, this is something that I talk about in my book. Another thing that has driven up the mental health problems of men, strangely enough, is us living for such a long time in peacetime. Now, I want to take you to World War II. Now, I've, I've worked a lot with World, uh, World War II veterans and with Vietnam veterans and from veterans in Afghanistan. And in those situations, as horrible as they are, there is an incredible job to do. And guys are able to focus and say, we have to get this job done. And again, I don't want to imply that females can't be soldiers or males can't be nurses. I'm talking about a big generalization here. Because if you can imagine on a battlefield where uh, there's a whole lot of guys that have to work together to get a job done, and one says, you know what, I'm, uh, I'm just not feeling too good today, all right? I'm feeling quite anxious at the moment, and look, I'd, I'd rather sit this one out. It's the same as the, the kangaroo hunt. We need everybody on board. You need to be able to push your feelings down to get something done, because lives are at stake. And men are good at pushing feelings done to get things done. And look, we've got to be appreciative to people throughout history that have done this. So it's not as though it's such a bad thing. It's just that in our society where we have the luxury of peace and prosperity, we get very uncomfortable. And I'm not saying that we need to have a war, but this is where things like sports become such a good outlet for men. And I often encourage people who have a male as a partner, let him watch his football, let him watch his basketball, all right? It's doing something inside that is very, very good. And even as males, we can share that. Uh, because you know what, Eric, males are not going to change all of a sudden. We're not all of a sudden going to become easy to talk to. But if we sort of say, hey, I'm a male, so I've got some strengths and some weaknesses, and I've got to get over this particular weakness. Otherwise, I am going to destroy myself. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's, it's such a powerful, you put it so simply, doctor, and I thank you so much for that because it's, 
you know, I'm sure many people have been exposed to the book, you know, men are from Mars, women yeah, are yeah, from yeah. Venus, and, and, you know, that idea of, like, team war, you know, versus, like, nurture yeah. village, like, yeah. that's all obviously hardwired, and, but then it's also, I wonder about the, the deepness of connections, right, so yeah. I, obviously, I've never served overseas yeah. or been in a war, but I have many friends and family members that have, yeah. and I've been a part of really long-term teams and then I worked in theater and film production so you yeah. know you basically live with people for months or a year making yeah. a piece of art and that those you know I'm drawing a correlation between what you said earlier and what you just said of yeah. the depth of those conversations you know the fact that Eric and I can you know over thousands of miles on the phone hear in each other's voice like are you sure you're good you know and yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I'm not sure you know and I, I was even thinking about how people used to work right like most men worked in more of a physical kind of job. They, you know, right. whether it was union or, you know, they were working in the factory floor or construction or right. hunting or whatever it is. And now here we are in these cubes where we used to at least be in a cube next to someone, but now we're in a cube in our own house most of the time. Yeah. And so you don't have that depth of connection or be able to see it. So what, what do you see in this sort of modern world? Like how, how do we educate or change people? You know, like you said, we're not going to change people overnight, but no. you know, how do we, push the awareness how do we push the understanding of that that we need to ask those questions or check in with ourselves yeah, yeah. and with each other that way yeah so the first thing is appreciating where we actually are and you mentioned that men are from mars and in uh in the the ancient symbolism mars is the bringer of war and women are from venus and venus is the goddess of love so there's there's a lot in that straight away that we can understand now if we understand and accept that we can go, okay, I don't have to feel bad about who I am. Because the first question is, uh, the first insight is, it's not wrong to be a male. It's not a deficit to be a male. It is a strength. In fact, when the, when the two get together, Venus and Mars, all right, we need that protective quality. We need all of that. So we need to keep that strength. However, Society is progressing. Society is evolving. Society is changing. We want peace. So we have this ability to adapt. And uh, now again, I'm, I, I, I'm in the book. I'm in step five as far as uh, uh, the five steps to men's mental health. Our ability to adapt. Because you know what? Our communication style is just another problem to be solved. So let's use our strengths and go, okay. How are we actually going to do that? And so let's take you and Eric as an example. There would have been some time when you first went, you know, Eric, I was depressed once. I, okay, well, you know, Mark, I've been through this and this. Okay. And you went, oh, really? You too? Yeah, 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 me too. So you would have made some sort of a connection that took your friendship deeper. And you don't stop with your strengths. You don't stop being males. But you go on with your life with this added layer of protection of somebody that you can actually trust i i love how he put that because mark and i've actually <laughs> we've had that conversation <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. and and even and even deeper conversations and yeah. one of the things as i i was reading your book and listening to you speak now and thinking back to the relationships that i have with men yes the ones that I find to be what, what you were saying, the deepest relationships are the ones in which I can be my most vulnerable yes. because I can shed that exterior layer. I can talk about what's really happening with me, but then I can also go and we can go to a bar, we can go out and we can ski and we can do uh, I'm using air quotes, the typical male things, yeah. but I also know that I have the ability to have those vulnerable, sensitive conversations with them yes. and they, yes. and I won't be judged. And I think yes. I'd be curious about your thoughts on that whole piece of, of judgment. And is that a, another layer of why men feel as though if I have this conversation with another man and I, and I show weakness, I'm going to be judged and going back to that, the old reference, I, I won't be part of that, that tribe any longer. Judgment is such a big stigma issue, Eric. You're quite right. 
But you see, we're actually progressing in this as well, because we started off talking about how men are from Mars, women are from Venus, men like to problem solve, women are good at communication. But of course, it's not that simple. It's a lot more complex than that. And in my book, I touch upon some of the theories of Jung, where he says, you know what, every female has a male side that they need to get in contact with. And you know what, that's happening in today's society. But every male also has a female side that they need to get into contact with. And you know what, that's happening. We're getting more female soldiers. We're getting more male nurses. We're getting more females that play rugby. We're getting more men that play violin or start to stay at home to take care of the grandchildren. That's all happening. And it is males getting in contact with their female side without feeling threatened. So when you start to make that trusting connection that you talked about, Eric, you're getting into contact with your female side. Now, initially a lot of males can feel a lot of males can feel very oh, exposed vulnerable and therefore judge for that and it's because when you're on the football field you know it'll be sort of like so eric i hear you're taking up knitting now all right <laughs> and we'll make a little joke about that all right but subconsciously what happens is to say oh they've heard about my knitting i better not tell them about how vulnerable i can get when i'm talking to mark all right i'll just leave that alone and that's where the judgment comes in, that we're not allowed to have feeling-based conversations or deeper relationships with some males more than others. Well, and it's interesting hearing it put like that, doctor, because there is this sense like, you know, when you talk about being in touch with your feminine side, obviously looking at the guy with like slightly long hair and a big beard, um, <laughs> but you know, my background is in theater, music. I've been a singer yeah. pretty much my whole life. Yeah. and an actor so i've been trained to not only get in touch with my feelings but to manipulate them and move them around yes. and i still find there's that moment of like i don't want to tell them this you know or or i don't want to admit that uh, that it's happening right like yeah. even even if i'm having a bad day yeah you know i'll generally tell my wife i would definitely yeah. tell eric yeah. Um, I have a few other really, really close friends, I would say, but th that deeper connection and trust is not, look, even, even I think for someone who is very mentally whole and doesn't have any mental injuries or issues, I think would be, it would be easy for them to admit that it's very difficult to trust another yes. person that yes. much, right? To really yes. like open it up and be like, yeah, this is, this is what's going on. But yeah. I think about even the people that I love and trust, I'm like, well, I don't need to burden them with that today, you know, or whatever male excuse I've come up with. So I don't have to like talk about it. Um, yeah. Even though I obviously enjoy talking and can yeah, barely yeah, yeah. shut up half the time. But <laughs> what, what do you think, you know, we, we talk about the modern world and I love this idea of like, you know, we, we, we've mentioned the Mars versus Venus thing and there's more of a balance of understanding, yes. you know, and, you know, and people laughed at young for talking about men having, feminine traits and 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 women having masculine traits yes. well i mean he wrote that what 120 years ago so it's obviously we're still there right it hasn't changed yes. in some yes. ways yes where do you think we are i mean with communication the way it is art you know you know the idea of you know the untangling of gender and sexuality which is such a big part of what's going on in sort of you know the western world so to speak right now where, where do you think we lie and where do you think we can help men understand that it is okay to say eric it's perfectly okay to not be okay how not do we always get not always be okay yeah <laughs> and not, not always, always be okay. sorry that's right, right. How, do, how do we get people to understand that besides look i want them to read your book i want them to listen to our podcast i think yeah. i think yeah. just these conversations alone are a big piece but i do wonder if there's something we're not doing in our own lives um with the people we care about to help yep yeah. And, and Mark, you mentioned the magic word and the magic word is actually trust. Uh, and to get to trust, what are we going to do about that? And OK, this is where I feel as a uh, as a psychiatrist, I have something of an advantage because we're trying to solve these problems of sexual expression, gender expression, diversity. We're trying to solve all these problems on a population level. And when we try to do that, it's going to take us decades to get through all of that. And you as an individual and I as individual and Eric, we're not going to sort through all of this today. 
However, on an individual level, when it's just you, Mark, when it's just Eric, when it's just me, or I'm sitting alone with a guy in my office, we're on an individual level. And so what we start to do is we start to build trust. We start to look at what the feelings are. We start to look at what's lying underneath everything. And yes, first of all, it's really scary because somebody has not shared their feelings to that extent, but it's in a framework that is meant to be problem solving. Somebody comes to a psychiatrist with a problem that needs to be solved. So in that sense, it's a very male setup. And knowing that as long as you can get to that level of trust on an individual level, you can get through whatever it is. That's what it comes to, the individual level. I like that we've, we've moved to that piece. Uh, yeah. We actually, speaking about your profession as a psychiatrist, we actually have, Mark will be excited now, we have a listener question that came Ooh. in from, from one of our male audience members. Yeah. And the question for you, doctor, is does societal pressure make men hesitant to be completely open and honest with their therapist? Totally, totally. Thank you for that question. In fact, one thing that I encourage people to do is not to see the problems in themselves, but that they, we are being pounded by a society that is putting much a lot of pressure on us. And that is actually the compounding our own problems. So the depression, the anxiety, the addictions come from pressures outside of ourselves. And if we get to our true selves, we're actually able to find the solutions. We're actually able to move forward in a way that's acceptable. But what's being said, and we're, we're trying to pressure men into putting their hands up to say, I need help. That's actually becoming more of a stigma and ending up perhaps, I don't have the science for this, perhaps it's working against us. But I, I believe that the very big thing is exactly what Mark said. It's at the onset. How do you get somebody to go and find help? Because once I make a connection with a male in my office, it's just wonderful. It's just amazing the ground that you cover. So there are two things that I kind of want to unpack there. The first one, I'm going to revisit something you said before Eric um, brought that up, because I think they're actually really related. Yeah. Um, is this idea of trust and especially yeah. for a man to talk about his feelings or his emotions or having anxiety or depression when do you think it had it, it you know because obviously the answer is yes we are just males but I do wonder if there is this sense or a lack of understanding of those emotions and how they sort of interact do you do you see that more in men right because like one, one of the easiest men are very good at expressing anger, right? Anger makes sense. Yes. We've been wronged, you know, right. screw you. I'm right. pissed. My That's team right. lost. I'm going to smash a glass, like whatever it is, That's but right. you know, fear or anxiety or even like tenderness, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like men are very good at being like, Oh, I love my wife or my kids, yes. but you know, having a soft spot for like another person or something like that is, it yes. doesn't seem as easy to communicate. And do yes. you, do you think that's just like an old school sort of like male versus female stigma? Or do you think it, it is more sort of like predisposed and genetic in that way? Well, that's, that's, that's a very difficult one to get, get to terms with. But the overall thing is that in, uh, in our society, we still have these stereotypes, if you want, we still have these sort of expectations. But we tend to look at these as bad. But we have to imagine that they've actually helped us build the society that we have right? Because there's, there's a time for getting things done. There's a time for getting on with a job, right? So that's, that's what we do. It's in our prosperity and in the luxury of where we are at the moment that we can say, guys, you can slow down and you can start revealing some of your feelings. And again, I don't have the science for this, but men tend to learn trust from women. Uh, women are able to trust in such a way that men can't because women, particularly women who have had children, really know what it's like to be vulnerable. So if, if I take you to that moment where a woman gives birth to a new human being, I mean, what an awesome responsibility. All of a sudden, you've got another human being dependent on you. But right at that moment, okay, you are very vulnerable. 
and in that vulnerable moment, you actually need a setup where, okay, going back to hunter gatherer days, there was a male making sure that this was all safe, right? But the woman was vulnerable and was able to trust the male that this is going to go okay. In fact, it almost becomes a second nature to females to trust. And when a male sees that trust, it's sort of like, I couldn't do that. I couldn't trust another person just like that. Because in the old society, that was not your role. Your role was actually to be protector. Those roles are changing, right? So we need to be able to adapt to integrate some of that trust, some of that, as Eric said, vulnerability, being able to share some of the vulnerability. I can be weak too. That's perfect. And so that, that actually unpacks part one of what I was going to ask very, very yeah. well. And it leads right into this. So this idea of vulnerability or choosing or somehow like finding that reason, right? Like it's really interesting, you know, thinking about some of the women we've had on, some of the ones that have had the worst mental injuries and mental issues that weren't necessarily chemical have actually been when that trust is broken, when a caregiver or someone they were depending on for that went away, right? And that's, yeah. and so I, I just, it occurred to me. And then I started thinking about, all right, here we are with this guy again, um, yeah. you know, this guy, hand up, for those not watching. <laughs> um, and we decide or we do realize there is something going on yeah. and we don't, we don't even have this definition of trust yet, right? Like even the way I'm hearing you say this. So I would love for you to unpack a little bit more because you talked about talking about the societal pressures or these things, right? And so often when you hear, especially people who are having suicidal ideations, yeah. th th there's never, it's never anything else's fault, right? Like yeah. it's all like, I have to make the voices in my head stop. It's all yeah. super internalized and super inward facing. Yeah. How, how do we help? people and how do you as a doctor and i'm sure you talk about this um in a lot of different ways so i'd love to just hear some of the things but like how do we get people to realize that it's it can be societal pressures it can be that we've somehow gotten programmed to think a certain way and that that isn't serving us uh my yeah. hand up again that's one i i'm batting my head against the wall a lot with or something as simple as like no like it is precious and important for you to live like those it, you know those ideas sound so simple out loud but we know as i know you know all too often the just one of those getting missed is what heads someone down this really dark path yes that's that's right and uh the bottom line is it's podcasts like this it's books like this it's conversations like this to make people aware that hey there's nothing wrong with being a male our big structures okay so let, let's take the medical industry of what i'm a past a part okay uh if you break your leg skiing Obviously, there's something wrong with your body, so we just fix your body. And the model that I work under is through that model, that if there's something wrong with your emotions, it must be something with your brain so that if we just tweak the chemicals in your brain, you'll be better. Well, we know in psychiatry that that model is totally inadequate. It does not work because we have been using antidepressants, right, to an extent unheard of decades ago and we haven't gotten less depression and anxiety we have more depression and anxiety so it's not just the body we have to see that um, what happens in psychiatry has to do with society has to do with our relationships has to do with our self-image so we've got to think broader but in a crisis of suicide that we have in males in particular at the moment we can't wait for the medical industry to change because it's a big ship and it turns around really slowly. So it's going to take decades before change comes up. Podcasts like this can help men realize, one, there's nothing wrong with being male. Number two, that help is out there. Number three, that you've got to take that risk of being vulnerable, of building trust, even if it's just with one person. Because if you trust one person, let's say it's your spouse or your best friend, and they say, you know what, Mark, you need to go so get some help, okay? You've got to trust that person and then go on the painful journey of finding help. Because when you find a good therapist, when you find a good psychologist or psychiatrist or counsellor, you go, wow, should have done this decades ago, right? But it's that initial step. 
So uh, to follow on this idea of trust and yeah. your point of there's nothing wrong with being a male, something yeah. that started to just spin in my head as I've been hearing this conversation. And it comes back to uh, a, an earlier podcast that Mark and I had, and, and we explored this uh, in depth as well. I, I can't help but start to think if part of this issue around male feeling, not wanting to feel vulnerable, not wanting to feel compassion, things like that, also stems from what we see in society as, as a larger issue, which is this, this confusion between what's gender versus what's sex, right? Then yeah. the two are very different. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Do you think that men mistakenly feel that if I'm vulnerable, if I show any kind of trust in that way to another man, whether it be a friend or a therapist, that it may even wrongfully begin to get in their own minds. Maybe I should, I'm, I'm questioning whether or not I'm even a male if I exhibit any of those traditional feminine like traits. Yes, yes, the answer is a resounding yes, because change happens slowly. Now, I'm a football fan, right? And I have been watching football in Australia since the 1970s. And in the 1970s, all footballers wore black boots. When I watch the same game today, there are some males that wear pink boots, some that wear yellow boots, some that wear red boots, and sometimes they will wear one pink boot and one yellow boot. And everybody goes, that's fine. If somebody had done that in the 1970s, they would have been laughed off the field. So what I'm saying with that is in that short time, and 50 years is actually a short time, we've actually progressed in our thinking. It's sort of like, hey, you're a great footballer. You wear whatever color boots you want. Yeah, I don't care. Right? But yeah. you, if you're scoring, nobody gives a shit what color your boots are. That's except, exactly ex right. Ex ex except in the NFL here in, in America, because they're so militant about what they wear that they just find them to get more money and the players do it anyway. So <laughs> they're totally different. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But, so, but we have, a, yeah. And that is such a good point. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to step on you, Mark. Just following on to what you were talking about with the boots, my friends know lots of earrings under these headphones, <laughs> love to paint my toenails. There's that side of me that I'm totally comfortable with that. Favorite color is pink. And you're yeah. right. I think 20 or 30 years ago, if I had gone out into society that way, people would have looked and gone, what's what's wrong with him now you know nobody looks and, and thinks twice and so uh, to me it's it's a it's it's a curiosity more than anything else if that has if that stigma still finds its way within the mental health space if men feel hey i can't show that side of myself lest people question who i am as a man yeah. what if <laughs> Doctor, I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Um, I do I do like to throw bombs sometimes. <laughs> okay, throw a bomb. Throw a bomb. <laughs> what, what, if, what, if, what if part of it is actually just, and, and this, this sounds terrible, but what if some of it is actually just taking a little bit of that personal responsibility of it? Like I, and, you know, I understand, like, it's hard to be vulnerable. It's hard to be this. It's hard to be that. But, yeah. you know, it's never easy to be wounded, right? But, you know, we had a very close friend of ours um, and the name of his episode was, you know, the pain of the pain of changing had to become less than being the same. Yep. Um, yep. Yep, you know, I'm paraphrasing him, but yeah, you know, yeah. and before yeah, yeah. he would, before he would get help and recover from his addiction and his associated mental health issues, yeah. what, from an education standpoint, what, where, why do you think it is that men and women get such a different message on that? Now, obviously, I, I agree with you. There are hardwired pieces of it, but I yeah. do feel like it, you know, just thinking about your boot analogy for the footballers, yeah. it also gets societally reinforced or, you know, pushed. And, you know, obviously, conversations like this will help, but, you know, I think about parents and, you know, even the struggle of like, you know, having to deal with, you know, you, you talk about people who have 
huge barriers to entry of like being healthy. It's like, well, what if there are questions about gender? You know, what, what if you're in a society or live somewhere where, you know, questions about sexuality are not tolerated, you know? And then, so how do you then, you know, from a large scale perspective, it's, it's, I feel like we can solve all of these things one-to-one. I love your point about that, but you know, from a generational standpoint, from a medical and scientific standpoint, you know, you know, where do you see us going? Like where, where's the next evolution in that that you've already, already mentioned where we're going, but where we, where we've come, but where do you see that kind of pushing us in that new direction? Yeah. Okay. So, so part of the problem in uh, discussions in the public arena is that we, we have to boil things down to sort of this or that so that people understand the issues and we've got to become much more nuanced is the word complex and accepting of new ideas okay and and this is why i boil it down to boots all right now there was nothing wrong in the 70s with saying guys wear black boots right but um in in the 21st century guys can wear pink boots so when you're teaching your uh, 14 year old and he goes dad can i wear green boots uh, to football and says son depends on how well you play football all right if you play football well nobody's going to care about your boots so what i'm saying is we're making progress and rather than saying that it used to be wrong and we're starting to get it right or it used to be right and we're starting to get it wrong is the idea of change change is just change we're emphasizing different aspects of the male psyche now because we are emphasizing getting in touch with the feminine side feminine side was always there but during world war ii we're not getting in touch with that we need something else but in peace and prosperity we can get in touch with that so we are encouraging males to allow themselves to get in touch with their vulnerable and trusting selves because it's always been there it just takes trust and vulnerability (laughs) Well, and it's funny because the boot reference, immediately I went to the next evolution. It's like, it actually doesn't matter even if you're terrible, wear whatever boots you want. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was like, right. like listening to us, I was like, we've already added like a layer of it. And <laughs> that's right. Sorry, but, Eric, we both went yeah, to the same. No, 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 not at all. That's fine, but we're not quite there yet. That's the whole we're thing. Not. We're not quite right. there yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and something I want to ask and is this whole idea around let's take men who are willing to be vulnerable, who are willing to have the conversation, who are very open and honest, and yet still unfortunately find existence so painful that they take their own life. And the reason I bring this up is one of my own personal heroes, you know, Anthony Bourdain, uh, unfortunately, uh, a couple of years back, took his own life. He was very open in his writing about uh, his prior drug use. And those around him, you know, said that he would talk from time to time about uh, what was going on with with his mental health. But it still came as such a great shock uh, to all of us who saw him as someone who really was great at showing both his male and his female sides. He was great about having conversations, very open and yet he still found it so painful. What, what would you attribute something like that to? See, that, that's, that's very difficult, Eric, because everybody that I have worked with that have either attempted suicide and are now okay, or have completed suicide, had their own unique story. And uh, we, we can't actually say that it's pressures in society that are causing suicide. What we can say is that pressures in society could be contributing to male suicide, right? It's just one factor in something that's huge. But as a basic message, to get across the idea that not only is it okay to be male, but it's okay to be you. Because most of us don't believe that. Most of us think that there's something fundamentally wrong with us and we're the ones that have got to change. You bring up a great point, doctor. And, you know, we recently had a guest on from Singapore that only just recently decriminalized suicide. Yeah. 
So, you know, there is this sense of like, right, you know, and, you know, for an American <laughs> to say that even that out loud, you're like, whoa, you know, like yeah. the idea of suicide being wrong yeah. is something for us that, you know, is steeped in religion or morality or a different thought yes, processes. Yes, it yes, it's yes, certainly yes. not something we put the government in charge of. No. And, <laughs> right? I mean, definitely not in the US. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But, you know, so I do wonder listening to you and talking about the idea of like, you know, and it, and I'm not making an excuse for you or teasing you about it. It is just what uh, it is. Uh, uh, uh. It, it, it gets a little bit like science speak, right? You know, you're contributing factors and yes, these different right. things. But I do, I do hear and I really value and I want to bring out one of the things you keep talking about is like this idea of our evolution of thought and yeah. what it is to be male and female and this idea of peace and prosperity. I think there is an important balance of like, we, you know, I'm in a marriage that doesn't adhere to a lot of gender roles. Uh, you know, for a very long time, I was very much the homemaker. My wife yeah. was the breadwinner. You know, we've never had children. And, you know, yeah. from the outside, like, you know, I'm very much a dude. She's very much a girl. Um, yeah. Although she does often refer to me as the gayest straight man she knows. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and before people actually wouldn't laugh at that. It would weird them out. So it's good that people yeah, laugh about right. it now. It shows some that's evolution. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it does. That's exactly, it's a very good point, Mark. Very it good. Is. Yeah. And so do you see though, do you see as like, you know, cause I think about emerging cultures, right? Emerging economies who, yeah. who haven't necessarily had it. Do you think we're seeing some of this stuff change, but also be brought to the forefront because we're seeing so many sort of for lack of a better term, like conflicts of like the new world versus what we were brought up with versus, you know, yeah. I think about like the okay boomer sort of thing where, you know, the millennials keep making fun of the boomers and us yeah. Gen Xers are confused by all of you. So whatever, yeah, 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 um, yeah. but you know, and that sort of strata, you know, the, the striations and strata of like how different people look at this generationally, you know, Eric and I talk a lot about how in all we are of the younger generation, especially teenagers and like early 20s right now, they, they're very open to talk about this stuff, especially as it relates to their own mental health and their own questions about gender and sexuality. And yes. for us, we're like blown away, but in some ways it actually seems to make it harder and even more confusing for them sometimes because it's like, it's all there. They could do, you know, whatever. Yes. And yes. how do you see that from a clinical standpoint? Like, how does that balance out? Okay, so, so firstly, I, I, I want to take on, uh, you showed some evidence of evolution, right, uh, in, in our thinking, right, that we will laugh at things rather than get weirded out, right? The younger generations have less stigma towards mental illness than the older generations. That too shows evolution. It shows that as we move on, we're getting a better outlook on all of this. However, the younger generations are struggling with their mental health a lot more than the older generation. So it actually is being normalized, but it's a kind of a problem. And, and this is where I want to, I want to say a few things about suicide because we, we went through a really hot topic sort of really quickly. And yes, we do tend to think of suicide in terms of religion or morality, is it right or wrong? And as a clinician, uh, what I see is that if a suicide occurs, then there was a problem that was not solved. So uh, suicide is still the enemy. And look, there was a wonderful study done on people who had jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. Now, less than 1% of people survived that jump, but without exception, on the way down, they all said, I wanna live. I don't wanna do this. So the frightening thing is that people get to a point, they make a decision and then they regret it. Uh, so if we could find out what the factors were to get them to that decision and sort them out, and that takes trust and vulnerability, and slowly, slowly we'll get there on an individual level rather than a population level. The follow on that thread, doctor, uh, you've talked about, I know, men especially being problem solvers, solution-based, and that idea of hating failure. And yeah, I don't know if there is an answer. I don't know if you have an answer, but do you think that the, the, either the thought of suicide or people who follow through with suicide, yeah. that it's them either recognizing that it, something has been a failure, so their mental health has been a failure, and then they take their life, 
or do you think that they take their life because they don't want to think that they failed in any particular way? Uh, yeah, Eric, that's that's a good way of looking at it. Again, I, I can't say that there's one one thing that yeah. is part of everybody, but that association that you made, failure, I'm no good, I'm out of here. That describes a lot of the process of suicide. So it comes down to the definition of failure. And the wonderful thing about our society, because it has many wonderful things, one of the wonderful things is we are becoming more accepting of the definition of what a person is, okay? We are actually saying, you're allowed to be you, all right? You're very different to what I am. You're very different to a lot of people. But hey, you're part of it. And that's the feeling that we all want. We all want to know that we're part of it. And one of the problems is that yeah, we're in all these gender debates, uh, sexuality debates, and let's say generation debates. Well, you know what? Sex and gender and generations have always been here. But 50 years ago, we didn't have this thing called the internet. So we weren't discussing these things as intensely as we did. We had people that had alternative lifestyles that got on with their alternative lifestyles and the rest of us didn't know. And all of a sudden, for some reason, all of us need to have worked out, you know, is gender non-binary? Is homosexuality okay? Is that, is that? And we're all being asked to have our opinions on things that quite frankly have nothing to do with our lives that went on for hundreds and hundreds of years, swimmingly, not quite, all right. Not quite. That's definitely a local versus a population relative. Question. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. That's right. That's a right. relative but, swimmingly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. But but let's say generations. We have always had generations, and um, we've always thought intergenerationally. But now it becomes a hot topic that threatens a lot of people because they become uncomfortable in who they are. Because the question comes up: Who am I supposed to be? The answer, of course, that's, is I'm supposed to be who I am. That yeah. and that, doctor, that, yeah. that's it right there. <laughs> and, and I thank you so much. And I know I, I actually asked a couple of questions that were kind of leading there. And then Eric got the one that was there because <laughs> so much of it, so much of what you were saying yeah. is all related to that. Right. And, and yeah. it honestly makes me want to smash this iPad and go live in a cabin in the woods yeah. because I do feel like so much of it. And look, it's very easy to point fingers outward and yeah. say, it's everyone else's fault, but yeah. there is a piece of me that's like, why, why do I even care about right. like what these other people think or, okay. you know, and honestly, I think it was one of the coolest things about when the podcast sort of first started and Eric approached me about it. Cause he was like, I don't know, is this something you'd be comfortable with? Like, we're going to talk about our own stories and like talk about other. And I was like, yeah, yeah I don't give a shit what people think. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. you know, if this saves one person's life or yes. makes one person live a little bit better, a little bit healthier and yeah. have a healthier relationship with themselves or someone else, like, whoo, we did something, yeah. you know? And yeah. I just, I love, and, and I, and um, I just, I love the aspect that you bring of balancing this idea of the clinical treatment of the person versus what they're sort of battling against on the whole, right? You yeah, know, and, we, I've, and I've got to just jump in there, Mark. I've got to jump yeah. in because- before I lose this point, um, okay, so we're saying that it's okay to be who you are, but to get that feeling of being okay with who you are, you need to have other people that say, yeah, it's okay to be who you are. And that is in essence what happens in a lot of psychotherapy when I work particularly with a male that had a whole lot of, let's say, desires, thoughts, or impulses that are all bad, they're all wrong. And I sort of go, well, no, this is what guys go through. And uh, it's okay for you to be you. And of course, we never have a conversation just like that. But one of the big things that happen is that somebody goes, really, it's okay to be me? And I kind of go, yeah, it is. Now, we never had that conversation like that. But that's the feeling underneath what's happening. And if you get that feeling from one person in life, then you know what? All of a sudden, you don't care what other people think because there's one person who believes in you. And that is wonderful. And I think another piece that I'm hearing from you, doctor, and tell me if I'm, I'm on the right track here. It's something that when we 
first started from Survivor to Thriver, the idea was it was a podcast. And what we're recognizing more recently is from Survivor to Thriver is more of a movement of building a community of people who are willing to speak up and speak out. And the podcast is really the voice of that movement. What I'm hearing from you is it's okay to be you. And the more people that start saying it's okay to be me, we're building that community of like-minded people. The more people will be willing to speak. Yes, that's right. And in a way, what you're doing is you're building a tribe, Eric. You're building a tribe of people that need to move from survivor to thriver right? Because uh, if you look for your tribe where you are not welcome, it's going to reinforce the idea that it's not okay to be you. So uh, you need to find people who say, yeah, you're like me, me too. Join us, become part of this tribe. Thank you. You mean it's okay to be me? Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of people like you here. And that's what we naturally do. And so a podcast like this can provide the forum for people who need that to validate themselves, to say, it's okay to be me, on with life. Brothers and sisters, go ahead and put on your yellow and pink boots. It is okay. <laughs> I, I, I think I, it's actually making me, I kind of want to have two different ski boots this winter, two different colors. Just, to, <laughs> I, you know, Doctor, I just, but as we sort of wrap up here, I want to make sure people know where to find, because I know you've written multiple books. We're, we're speaking specifically about yeah. five steps to men's mental health. Uh, yes. Where can people find that and find you? Okay. Right. So uh, the books can be found on Amazon, but uh, I have a website, Dr. Christian Heim, Dr. Christian Heim, uh, and there you can find everything to our, uh, uh, our platforms like Instagram uh, and LinkedIn. And also, uh, I, I tend to join men's groups on Facebook because there, you, there too, you find communities of people helping each other out. And it's just so beautiful to see, Mark, guys helping each other out in hard times. No, and, and you know, <laughs> things evolve in weird and mysterious ways, right? That's kind of how life works. And yeah. Eric and I, you know, kind of sat down months ago to be like, oh, I don't know what this is. And all of a sudden, it's it's a community. It's a yeah. movement. There's a lot of ways to... and. You know, I feel like part of it, it was sort of born from the pandemic and 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 we're reacting in some ways to it. But at the same time, I do feel and I and, and I wonder if you feel this way as well. I feel like the pandemic just kind of like ripped the rose colored glasses off. You know, I don't oh, know yeah. if we're oh, seeing yeah. more. It's just it's more obvious because people have to like sit by themselves or sit with yeah. like one person who, you know, and, you know, so many people like, you know, we, I don't know about you, but Eric and I are very lucky to have wonderful, incredible, fulfilling marriages. So we had one yeah. person all the time, yeah. um, which helps. But, you know, so many people don't have that or, right. or or thought they did and then realized they didn't, which is even worse. And yeah. so here we are, you know, and so I really, I value the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Um, if okay. you have anything else to add, please, like, you know, we don't have to end yeah. this minute. So if you've got more. No, 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 that's, no, no. Uh, Mark, what I want to add is the work that you guys are doing in a podcast. I, I, I want to give you an idea. I want you to go the extra step, okay? Because you are building a community. You are building a, a group of people who understand. But the next step is to organize a weekend away in Colorado for any listener from Survivor to Thriver who wants to join other people who are part of this tribe so that it, it comes out of the screen and into flesh and blood, all right? And we're, we're just working gonna get on to it. <laughs> that, that's great. That, that is great. Because, yeah. because, I, just, I don't know if you could see as you were saying that, but Eric and I are both like. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be, I have to be fully transparent. A, a part of what I'm doing while I'm down here during this month uh, is not only working through the podcast and work, we're working on getting our website built, but there is a larger business model to From Survivor to Thriver, which uh, exactly hits upon, Doctor, what you were just talking about. Fantastic. And not only building community, but something else that you had mentioned in your book was this idea of how people are much more, especially men, are much more willing to talk when they're engaged in activity. And so combining that concept of community with movement and being outside, outdoors, 
as Colorado, Hawaii, wherever it may be, uh, is is where a little preview maybe of of where from survivor to thriver uh, is going to be heading in the future. So yeah, thank you, wonderful. thank you, wonderful, thank you. That's thank you, and well, and one of the and one of the cool things, Doctor, is so much of Eric and I's journey and many of our sort of community journey is being in the outdoors and being physically active is yeah. actually where we either found our most health or realized that we weren't living our best life in other regions. I'm speaking specifically to myself and, you know, whether it's been skiing, mountain biking, surfing, um, God, so many different outdoor activities, but we've realized uh, for both men and women, but we've noticed it a lot in men is that connecting to nature. And if you think about it, it's so in line with so much of, you know, and so much of what you're talking about of like finding trust, finding those things and finding that, you know, sharing those kinds of experience experiences with other people, you know, that's, so that's why we were both like, yeah, cause that's <laughs> the idea, like, you know, it's going to have movement in the outdoors. Um, we would love to have guests like you come and, and lead sessions and help people find other ways to cope Fantastic. and manage and you know, and that's exactly, um, I guess, I guess we're sort of revealing it right now, but that's, okay. that's, what, we're, that's what we're working on. Uh, <laughs> I, originally, look, I originally thought the uh, surfing was going to take place on the island of Maui, which it can, but it may have to take place as well on the Gold Coast, Doctor. We may have to go up to, <laughs> we may have to go up to Brisbane in order to entice you to come uh, lead one of our sessions. So. Absolutely. Oh, I could cope with going to Hawaii. No worries. Okay. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, Dr. Christian Heim, thank you so much. Eric, any more words before we pass on? Uh, no, uh, just thank you so much for, for being on. It's, uh, it's such, it's such a, a big topic. Uh, yeah. And one that I know we'll probably have more conversations about. I don't even think we went down the, the whole road of listening as a key to communication and the differences yeah. between men and women, men and women and listening. And so that could be yeah. a, a whole other podcast, but yeah. thank you. I look forward to, to collaborating and do some things uh, in the future. Yeah. And uh, we could probably talk offline about your whole piece on music as well as you can tell Mark and I are both musicians. So yeah, yeah, thank that's you. Great. That's great. Guys, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been my pleasure and all the best for you and your listening tribe, okay? Thank you so much for all of you listening and watching out there. Dr. Christian Heim, five steps for men's mental health. Love the idea. Can't wait to start putting them into practice for myself as well. Uh, on behalf of Eric DeRosa and myself, Mark Fernandes, this is From Survivor to Thriver, episode 41. I will leave us with these words as I always do. Let's all please be as well as we can. Thank you.